Beloved in the Lord Jesus Christ, as we gather for worship this morning, let's lift our voices and gather together singing praise to our God from hymn 164, hymn 164, Oh, for a thousand tongues to sing. Good morning, everyone, and welcome to worship at Covenanters as we gather in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and we enter into the presence of the Father through Him and empowered by the Spirit who dwells in us as believers in Jesus Christ. A welcome to all who are visiting with us. We pray you likewise will be blessed with us this morning as you worship with us. As we have our worship service this morning, um, which our usual worship service, and then we'll have our usual time of fellowship and then sermon discussion. So we have, this is our morning laid out, um, and so as you listen to the sermon, engage with the Word, and uh, as you may have questions, uh, thoughts on, on the message the Lord is bringing to us, you can bring that to sermon discussion or other questions perhaps as you've been reading in the Scriptures this week or uh, having discussions with, uh, with your neighbors, whatever it might be, we can have a time of fellowship that we pray would be a blessing, a blessing to our souls. And then we gather again for worship this afternoon. And uh, we'll continue uh, as we dip into the book of Proverbs and consider uh, some of the very practical wisdom of our God and uh, consider uh, the, uh, where uh, and how we can live out uh, our Christian lives in, in where the rubber meets the road, where the realities of, of God's wisdom meets our lives. So join us again at 4.30 as we worship our God and hear Him speak to us from His Word. Let's take a few moments now before we... Uh, formally enter into worship before God calls us into His presence. Let's take a few moments in silent prayer to prepare ourselves for worship.
Brothers and sisters, please stand and hear your God call you to worship. In the book of Revelation, chapter 1, hear the words of our God. Grace to you and peace from Him who is and who was and who is to come, and from the seven spirits who are before His throne, and from Jesus Christ, the faithful witness, the firstborn from the dead, and the ruler over the kings of the earth. To Him who loved us and washed us from our sins in His own blood and has made us kings and priests to His God and Father, to Him be glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. Let's pray. Blessed Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, You are glorious from eternity. You have, Lord, existed in perfect purity and holiness and justice and mercy forever and ever. We, whom you have created, come into your presence to, Lord, fellowship with you. You who, Lord, in in the Trinity have, have enjoyed that perfect fellowship. You have been so gracious, so full of love to create us in order that we might know that fellowship as well, that we might be able to come to know the one true living God and, Lord, to dwell with You and to enjoy that relationship with You. Lord, we thank You for the sweet communion that we have with You. We bless You, Father, for making us, for showing such mercy and such grace to us even in our sin, that You have sent Your Son to be our Savior, to reconcile us to Yourself, that we could have that communion again with You. We thank You, Lord Jesus Christ, for being that faithful Savior, the one, Lord, who entered into our humanity to save us from our sin and to to make us like You, to Lord, give us that eternal hope that begins already now and to restore us to your Father. And we thank you, Holy Spirit, that you have come to dwell in us as believers in the Lord Jesus Christ, to further the the faith that you have worked in us and to grow and mature us and to prepare us for heavenly glories. Lord, we thank you for your mighty work for us. We bless you, Father. We worship you, Son. We give you glory Holy Spirit. And as we ponder each person of the Trinity, we give thanks for the three, and we are reminded of the unity of our God. There is one God, and we, Lord, confess You as one, and we adore You. Oh, Lord, lead us in our worship this morning to the praise of Your great name. Indeed, oh, Lord, shine Your gracious face upon us and give us true and divine peace. We look to You in this morning. We come in many different states. Some of us, Lord, are struggling with sin. Some of us are broken because of pain and suffering in this life. Some of us are just coasting along and going through life, and, and things seem, all, seem fine. And others, Lord, we're rejoicing, and we, we are really we're feeling the joy, and we're being encouraged. And in every state, Lord, continue the work that You're doing in us. And may we know that we have met with you and that your presence would be powerfully uh, a powerful blessing to us. Thank you for this time. And we, uh, Lord, pray for your blessing upon it. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's sing again praise to our God, lifting our voices to Him with hymn 27. Hymn 27, great God, how infinite art thou.
seated. Open the Word of God to Matthew 6, verses 31 to 34. Hear the commands of our Lord Jesus Christ. As we hear the Word of God, let us search our own hearts, confess our sin and seek the grace of God to live faithfully as He commands us to do, and to live, as we're going to hear a bit later as well, in the liberty of salvation that Jesus Christ has given us. Matthew 6, verse 31, Therefore, do not worry, saying, What shall we eat? What shall we drink? Or what shall we wear? For after all these things the Gentiles seek. For your heavenly Father knows that you need all these things. But seek first the kingdom of God and His righteousness, and all these things shall be added to you. Therefore, do not worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow will worry about its own things. Sufficient for the day is its own trouble. Well, let's come before our Father who does indeed care for us. Let's seek His grace as we confess our sin. O Lord, our God, Heavenly Father, we thank You that that You have given us the freedom to live for You. You who love us so perfectly and wonderfully, You, Lord, promise to provide for our every need. And Your perfect love casts out fear, fear of condemnation, fear that we will lack what we need, fear of being forgotten, fear of being mistreated. Oh Lord, this is the confidence that we can have in You because You have declared Your love for us and have demonstrated it to us over and over again. And such confidence, oh Lord, in You enables us to give freely to You, to give freely of our time for Your service. We can take this Sabbath day off as a day of worship for You will provide our needs and we do not need to fret about who will pay the bills and how the food will make it to the table. Lord, Your grace and care enables our free and generous tithing of the resources You give us for Your service. For You are indeed the source of all that we have. Lord, Your kindness and care enables us to give our lives for You, for our lives are from You, and they are made for You. Lord, and we pray that we would give ourselves to accomplish Your purpose for us. In short, Lord, Your provision enables us to seek first Your kingdom and its righteousness. Lord, we can trust You that as we seek Your kingdom, that we will not be left behind by You. Forgive us, Father, when we doubt You. Forgive us when we fear that we'll lack some good thing in our lives. Or forgive us when we abuse Your good gifts and take for ourselves first before we give some of the leftovers of our lives to You. Lord, like our Savior when He was tempted by Satan in the wilderness, may we not only believe in God, but believe God. May we believe You and what You have said and every promise You have made. And may we trust You so thoroughly that even in hard times and difficult situations and the struggles of our present existence, that we would know You are providing and You will never, no, never leave us nor forsake us. You are the one who has made all things out of nothing. There is not anything you could, there, there's not anything that you, uh, that, you, that you won't provide for us if you deem it good. We have all things. We have all things, Lord, that, can, uh, that, that, uh, that, you, that is good for us that we need. And Lord, we all have things on our minds that can weigh on us, or things that fill our hearts, about maybe, maybe about later today or tomorrow or, or the, some other time in the future. We pray, help us to rest this day and to worship You. 
in whatever ways we've sinfully handled our responsibilities. And Lord, we pray, forgive us and correct us and build our trust. We thank you, Father, for your powerful yet personal care, even now, as you forgive us through our Lord Jesus Christ. It's in his name we pray, and by him we persevere. Amen. There's the the words of assurance of forgiveness for God has provided for us in Christ and of a reminder that He will always, because He has given us Christ, He also will always give us every other thing that we need. From Romans 8, verses 31 to 34, what then shall we say to these things? If God is for us, who can be against us? He who did not spare His own Son, but delivered Him up for us all, how shall he not with him also freely give us all things? Who shall bring a charge against God's elect? It is God who justifies. Who is he who condemns? It is Christ who died and furthermore is also risen, who is even at the right hand of God, who also makes intercession for us. Our Savior prayed for us as we prayed in these past moments, and he continues to make intercession for us. He provides forgiveness the Father forgives us for His sake, and gives us every good thing that we need. Let's give thanks to our God then as we respond to our Lord in an act of worship and giving our tithes and offerings for His service. Please take your hymnal and turn to hymn 538, hymn 538, more about Jesus would I know, and we'll stand to sing to our God.
Please be seated. Turn the word of God to Isaiah 61. Isaiah 61, which is the passage that our Lord will read in the synagogue in Nazareth from Luke 4, which is where we'll turn next. The word of the Lord from Isaiah 61. The Spirit of the Lord God is upon me. Because the Lord has anointed me to preach good tidings to the poor. He has sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives and the opening of the prison to those who are bound, to proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord and the day of vengeance of our God, to comfort all who mourn, to console those who mourn in Zion, to give them beauty for ashes, the oil of joy for mourning, the garment of praise for the spirit of heaviness that they may be called trees of righteousness, the planting of the Lord, that He may be glorified. And they shall rebuild the old ruins. They shall raise up the former desolations, and they shall repair the ruined cities, the desolations of many generations. Strangers shall stand and feed your flocks, and the sons of the foreigner shall be your plowmen and your vine dressers. But you shall be named the priests of the Lord. They shall call you the servants of our God. You shall eat the riches of the Gentiles, and in their glory you shall boast. Instead of your shame, you shall have double honor. Instead of confusion, they shall rejoice in their portion. Therefore, in their land, they shall possess double. Everlasting joy shall be theirs. For I, the Lord, love justice. I hate robbery for burnt offering. I will direct their work in truth and will make with them an everlasting covenant. Their descendants shall be known among the Gentiles and their offspring among the people. All who see them shall acknowledge them. They are the posterity whom the Lord has blessed. I will greatly rejoice in the Lord. My soul shall be joyful in my God, for He has clothed me with the garments of salvation. He has covered me with the robe of righteousness. As a bridegroom decks himself with ornaments, and as a bride adorns herself with her jewels. For as the earth brings forth its bud, as the garden causes the things that are sown in it to spring forth, so the Lord God will cause righteousness and praise to spring forth before all the nations. Let's now turn to Luke 4. Consider Jesus, the synagogue in Nazareth. We're going to consider this, uh, this one Sunday service over two Sundays. Uh, as we're going to read verses 14 to 30, and then just consider verses 14 to 21 this morning. In the context, Jesus has been baptized, He has been tested in the wilderness, both parts of His inauguration and a public ministry, and now His public ministry begins. As Luke begins here, verse 14, Then Jesus returned in the power of the Spirit to Galilee, and news of Him went throughout all the surrounding region, and He taught in their synagogues, being glorified by all. So He came to Nazareth, where He had been brought up. And as his custom was, he went into the synagogue on the Sabbath day and stood up to read, and that he was handed the book of the prophet Isaiah. And when he had opened the book, he found the place where it was written, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me, because he has anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He has sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives and recovery of sight to the blind, to set at liberty those who are oppressed to proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord. Then he closed the book and gave it back to the attendant and sat down. And the eyes of all who were in the synagogue were fixed on him. And he began to say to them, Today this scripture is fulfilled in your hearing. So all bore witness to him and marveled at the gracious words which proceeded out of his mouth. And they said, Is is this not Joseph's son? And he said to them, you will surely say this proverb to me, physician, heal yourself. Whatever we have heard done in Capernaum, do also here in in your country. Then he said, assuredly, I say to you, no prophet is accepted in his own country. 
But I tell you truly, many widows were in Israel in the days of Elijah when the heaven was shut up three years and six months, and there was a great famine throughout all the land. But to none of them was Elijah sent except to Zarephath in the region of Sidon to a woman who was a widow. And many lepers were in Israel in the time of Elisha the prophet, and none of them was cleansed except Naaman the Syrian. So all those in the synagogue, when they heard these things, were filled with wrath, and they rose up and thrust him out of the city, and they led him to the brow of the hill on which their city was built, that they might throw him down over the cliff. Then passing through the midst of them, he went his way. Let's ask the Lord to teach us by His Spirit as we open the Word. Lord in heaven, we thank You for the Scriptures read. We thank You for the Savior and the message He proclaimed. And we pray that this message would be a message brought with power by Your Spirit to our lives and to our hearts this morning. So God, help us to hear and respond with faith, and we do look to You expectant for You to to fill us and to teach us and to train us as we need it. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, brothers and sisters, the the fight has begun. The war is underway. Jesus Christ is beginning the offensive against Satan, against his his kingdom against the the dark Lord Himself and all the evil that He brings. (coughs) Last week, we already began to consider the victory of Jesus Christ as He was victorious over Satan's attempt to derail His ministry before it really began. He resisted the temptations of Satan, trying to get Him to fall, to distrust His Father time and time again. But Jesus Christ crushed him by the word and with trust in his heavenly Father. And as we considered last week, because Jesus won that victory, he did it not only for himself, but for us. He won that victory so that you and I, who are trusting in Jesus Christ, have the same power of Christ to resist Satan that he would flee from us. He empowers us to win the victory that he has won. Well, there Jesus was, as it were, on the defensive. Satan was coming at him. But now Jesus goes on the offense. Now he begins to take his light into the darkness. He begins to preach heaven to those who are on their way to hell. He comes very right to the gates of Hades, and he will see them crumble before him. This is no... This is no time to look at the Scriptures and think, oh, I've read this all before. I've heard this before. Really, there's there's not much new here. This is the the greatest battle you'll ever consider. I don't know what movie you might have watched last night or what what novel you're reading now, but there's no story, no no story of, of triumph and victory and war like this one. Your life is at stake. Your very, uh, your, your very relationship with God and, your, the, and, and, and the difference between dwelling with Him in heaven or going to hell is at stake. And Jesus Christ comes and He declares that, that this is the day of the Lord. This is the year of the Lord's favor. The one where God, the time that God has sent the great message of salvation to the world and not only does Jesus come and preach, but He provides Not only does He declare God's hope, but He provides the hope that you and I need. You and I need to be captivated by this message of Jesus Christ and to tell others who are captive to Satan all about Him. And by God's grace, as we consider Jesus preaching in Nazareth, may we know the freedom that is given to us through faith in Jesus Christ, and may we increase in living out our life in the freedom He brings us. We are no longer captive to Satan. If you you are in Jesus Christ, you're no longer captive to Him, but are freed to live for Him. Jesus powerfully preaches Himself as the one God promised would set captive sinners free. Jesus powerfully preaches Himself as the one God promised would set captive sinners free. We're going to first set the context in verses 14 to 16 as Jesus powerfully preaches. And then verses 17 to 21, we're going to consider how Jesus 
powerfully preaches himself as the one to set sinners free. Well, Jesus comes on the offense in verse 14. Luke really starts a new phase of Jesus' ministry. We're now, we're now past the birth narrative. We're now past the inauguration of Jesus' ministry. And now we're beginning to see the beginnings of his ministry. And Luke, as he does, more than the other gospel writers, emphasizes that Jesus is not only beginning this ministry, uh, is, is not only, he's not only emphasizing Jesus' beginning of his ministry, but that he's beginning this in the power of the Spirit of God. The Holy Spirit, who has come upon him, who came upon him at his baptism to empower him for his public work, has never left him. And Jesus is coming now in power to begin his work. He did not come out of the wilderness limping and barely alive after his fight with Satan. He came out as a victor, as one who had won a great victory. He came out strong, not weak. The Holy Spirit of God is upon him. He returned in the power of the Spirit to Galilee, and he begins his ministry, and the word, the the, the fame of Christ begins to spread throughout the region. It's amazing just to stop and think for a moment that you and I are empowered by the same Holy Spirit that was upon our Lord. It's His Spirit whom He sends upon us. The Holy Spirit of God comes to us. We are never alone as Christians. You and I are never alone to live and walk the Christian life. As Leon Morris writes, uh, Luke, Luke's emphasis on well, the Holy Spirit should encourage us. Luke does not think of God as leaving people to serve Him as best they can out of their own resources. God's love is seen in the Spirit who enters and empowers and guides the followers of Jesus. And while the emphasis in Luke's gospel is mostly on Christ here and the Holy Spirit upon Christ and His ministry, even already in Luke, but especially in the Acts, we see how God faithfully sends His Spirit upon His people so that they can live and walk in faithfulness and empowered to live for Him. So Jesus comes in the power of the Spirit, and He comes into Galilee, and we're really going to see through chapter, most of chapter 9, this section of text is all about Jesus' ministry in Galilee before He sets His face to Jerusalem and goes to the cross. So from, from here up through chapter 9, we're going to see His focus of His ministry in Galilee. And Galilee was the northern part of Israel's territory. It was, there was Galilee in the north and Judea in the south, and Judea, of course, is where Jerusalem was. And as, you've, uh, as, as you probably well know, Galilee was looked down upon by the religious elites in Jerusalem. It was the place of, of uh, that's where, the, yeah, they were Jews, but they weren't as high of caliber. In fact, uh, as uh, the, 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 the council of religious leaders in John 7 is discussing uh, Jesus and wanting to get rid of Jesus, and Nicodemus speaks up and says, well, I, you know, shouldn't we, d- does our law condemn someone without hearing them? And they didn't respond to that. They just said, look and see. There's no prophet. There's no, no prophet comes out of Galilee. That's not, where, that's not where God sends, get, that's not where He has uh, people, uh, his, his good people. They are, they're all in Jerusalem. But Jesus was here, perhaps indeed part of His humility, being in a place where He would know He would have been despised and, not, and, and, and looked down upon by others. But as Jesus begins His ministry, the fame of Him, the news of Him begins to spread, and it spreads throughout that whole region. As he goes from synagogue to synagogue, preaching the kingdom of God. That was the way Jesus established the kingdom. That's what Jesus did as he, uh, that was his priority in his ministry. He preached the kingdom of God. Repent and believe, for the kingdom of God is at hand. It was his priority. Yes, there, was, there were healings, and there was casting out of demons. And there are other other miracles, but all of them were there only to support His preaching ministry, to show forth the fact that He is who He says He is, and He is bringing to pass what He says He will bring to pass. And so, that's the pattern we find through the whole New Testament. It is the preaching of the Word that gains the priority of the church, and so it ought to be today. It's not what uh, many think ought to be the priority of the church, because it seems so boring, and it seems so, uh, so just, it doesn't seem like it's something that would really attract people to the faith. But remember what Paul says in 2 Corinthians 10, the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, that is fleshly, what it necessarily appeals to the flesh, 
but they're mighty in God for pulling down strongholds, casting down arguments, and every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God, bringing every thought into captivity to the obedience of Christ. And so Jesus preaches the Word. If you wanted to find Jesus, where would you go? You would go to church. That's where you'd find Jesus. He was in the synagogue each Sunday. If you want to find Jesus, where do you go? The answer hasn't changed in 2,000 years. You go to church. You come to hear the Word of God proclaimed. That's where you find Jesus. Now, the synagogues that Jesus would go to were places of worship for the Jewish people. The synagogues uh, were the, the history, the, the, or, the, uh, the, uh, we don't know much about their origin other than they seem to develop after the first temple was destroyed and the people of God went into exile in places like Babylon, in the, in the Babylonian Empire and, and had places to gather to read the law and to consider God's Word. And that through the periods between the Old and the New Testament that continued to develop and grow. And so by the time of Jesus' ministry, Many communities had synagogues, places of worship. They were not competitive with the temple in Jerusalem. The temple was where sacrifices took place as well as there was teaching. But in the synagogues, it was gathering together to worship God, to pray, to hear the law and the prophets read, and someone would lead in worship, would bring and would teach. And that's the case here. As Jesus gathers for worship on the Sabbath day, He is asked to bring a message. He's asked to read here, in this case, the law, or sorry, the prophets rather, and to then explain them or speak about them. So Jesus uh, was being invited, um, uh, that's in Nazareth, wherever he was throughout the Galilee region, as as his reputation grew and people saw him as a rabbi and a teacher, the rulers of the synagogues would invite him to bring a message. And initially there was praise. He was being glorified by all, that is, not as glorified as God, but as they, they did not see that, but as, a, uh, as, as one who was likely who was sent by God, as one who was worthy of praise. And Mark tells us that they were, they were amazed because he taught them with authority and not as the scribes and the Pharisees taught, but he taught them with, a, with, a, with an authority they saw was more than just on the surface. And though that didn't last... Though that that reputation of Jesus didn't last amongst the people, yet this was the initial reaction. Well, he comes to Nazareth. Now, we like our hometown heroes. You know, we come from small. We come from a small town, but there's somebody famous that came from our town. We like other people to know about it. When I was when we were in Cape Breton a couple years ago, and, and driving through Port Hood, uh, there's a sign. It says right on there, "Home of Al McInnes." Now, most of you are not going to know who Al McInnes is. I know who Al McInnes is because I like hockey, but he's a famous hockey player. Most of you are saying, oh, yeah, I, I knew that. But certainly to Port Hood, he is, you know, his, he, he may have been a hockey player a while ago, but the pride has not diminished at all. And, uh, you know, we see that on different signs, home of so-and-so. And yes, I know Rita McNeil is from Nova Scotia. I, I understand that now. It didn't take long for me to be told that after we moved here. See, there's, there's a sense of pride. You know, someone, someone makes it big and then they're a celebrity. And we look, we're excited when they, when they come, come to visit or make a donation to the local, some local charity. And that's in a sense of Jesus coming back to Nazareth. You have to understand, he had become a regional, something of a regional celebrity. He was, the crowds were going to him, people had heard about him, and, and he was now coming to Nazareth. And I, I, I guess to, to maybe make this a little clearer for you, I think I missed, I missed one part of this description. When Jesus comes to Nazareth, Luke kind of takes a story that happens a year or so down the road into his ministry and brings it back to the beginning of his ministry. And so Jesus had to develop this reputation. That's what verses 14 and 15 describe for us. His name was going out there. He was preaching throughout Galilee, but he had not yet come to Nazareth. Matthew 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 and Mark put this encounter in Nazareth further on in their Gospels. But Luke brings it to the front because he's trying to show us kind of a typical... Uh, a typical preaching and response, a typical time of Christ bringing the Word in a synagogue and how the people responded to it. He wants us to see kind of, as it were, this time in Nazareth served as, a, as what was going on uh, in His ministry and what was happening. 
And so Jesus is coming back to Nazareth. He's coming back to the place where he had grown up. He's, the town was a buzz. There wasn't an empty seat in the synagogue. He, everyone was interested. What's he going to say? We've heard lots of things. We're going to consider just his preaching now and his, the, more of the response next week. But already there's, there's lots going on as he comes to Nazareth. And as, he, as, he, as was his custom, it's a great custom, he went to church. He went into the synagogue on the Sabbath day. That was his pattern of life and living. And he went there to read and to preach. So that's the, this is the context as Jesus comes to powerfully preach. He'd already been preaching, and now he comes to Nazareth, and we focus in on this one example. Jesus powerfully preaches. And he powerfully preaches himself as the one God promised would set captive sinners free. Well, we set the context. Now let's hear what he both reads and preaches. Luke wants us to both hear what he read and understand how he applied it in his message at the synagogue that Sabbath day. Well, first we have Jesus reading from Isaiah. We consider the anticipation in Isaiah of this message and both the, what the people anticipated in Jesus' day, but also what this prophecy anticipated of God would do. He was handed the, the book of the prophet Isaiah. It was uh, I think this, this language is a little bit misleading because we think of a book and we think he was handed a Bible like this. And that's just what we picture. But no, he was handed scrolls, which had, uh, you know, you had to unscroll one side and, and, and then scroll, uh, and, and scroll up the other side just to try to make your way to the middle of the section you wanted. He had to, instead of opening a book, he unrolled a scroll is actually the literal language here. He unrolled a scroll until he came to the section of Isaiah that he wanted to read. That is the portion from Isaiah 61. It's quite an awesome thing to think. We read Isaiah 61, but we didn't read it in the Hebrew. And Jesus has read the same words. And there, 2,000 years ago, He's also reading the same Scriptures. This is the Word of God, as powerful today as it was then. All of it inspired. It doesn't become inspired because Jesus read it, and it's in red letters in some of your Bibles. It was the inspired Word of God. It remains the inspired Word of God. And Jesus Jesus reads it authoritatively. This is the Word of God. We get to read and be instructed by still today. Well, in the context of Isaiah 61, we can go back to Isaiah as we consider what Jesus read. In the context of Isaiah 61, before we even get there, as you, as you read through chapters 57, 58, 59, 60, you get a real sense that the people were in a, in a bad place. They were being, the, the, the punishments of God upon them for their sin was being, uh, was being declared by the prophet Isaiah. They were being, they were, the, the punishments God was, was, was saying was going to come upon them. They would be in great distress because they had not lived for God with all their heart, mind, soul, and strength because they had excused their sins against God, the little ones, and they became bigger and bigger and bigger until sin was the characteristic of their lives, even as God's people, even God's covenant people. These were those who, who had, who, whose worship, Isaiah would say elsewhere, was, was full of lip service. In other words, they spoke all the right things, they went to the temple at the right times, they gave what they ought to give, but they had no heart in it. They had no love for God. They showed up but not really. These were those who they had much, many priorities in life of status, of wealth, of security, of whatever other things that come up in their everyday life that were prioritized before God, and they then would turn themselves to worship those things that they thought would give them what they wanted. Now, we, again, we, you know, this, this, as we think about this, is our life really changed? Is the temptation really different? We have lots of things we also prioritize. There are lots of things we look to and give, uh, give uh, uh, our attention and focus to because we think it will provide security for us. They're not idols of gold and silver that, we, that, we, that are shaped into something that we fall down and worship physically, but they're the things we put our hope in, the things we rest on and lean on, the things that make us feel good when we have them, and when they're gone, they make us, they send us into, uh, uh, they, they make us struggle because we, we oh no, what, our foundation is taken away. This is what the people of God were doing. They were listening to their hearts and following their bodies and doing what they felt and what they wanted instead of what God had told them. What would your choices say any different about what your life is like? And thus, 
exile was in their future because sin was in their present. And we see the results of sin. That's what, that's what uh, Isaiah 61 uh, does describe, though in Isaiah 61 and, and Luke 4, there's the talk of, of, uh, of, of the restoration, yet we see what sin has done, what they need to be restored from. These were, these were those who were, who were poor. That means they were destitute. They were powerless and weak and unable to help themselves. They, were, they did not have what they needed and they could not provide for themselves. They were downtrodden. They were beaten. Their hearts were broken. That is, they were, they were beaten up by sin and by the evil that they brought upon themselves. They were taken captive and in bondage to the evil one. They were, they were, they were slaves to sin. And once they had gone down that path, they had no way of turning back themselves. They were so into the darkness that their eyes were blinded to the light and knowing what is good from what is evil. And God in His mercy, even as His judgment comes, He, he, he promises to bring them restoration. In Isaiah 59, uh, uh, 16, the Lord saw it and it displeased Him that there was no justice. He saw that there was no man and wondered that there was no intercessor. Therefore, what did God do? His own arm brought salvation for Him and His own righteousness, it sustained Him. God was going to bring salvation and restoration. He would bring. Further on in Isaiah 59, we read, the Spirit of the Lord will lift up a standard against Him, that is against, in this case, against the enemies of God's people. The Redeemer will come to Zion and to those who turn from transgression in Jacob, says the Lord. God promises to provide a salvation that people couldn't provide for themselves. He promises to rescue them from bondage and from darkness and from every other consequence of sin. And He promises a Redeemer who, upon whom He would put His Spirit. And then we come to Isaiah 61, and what do we hear? The Spirit of the Lord is upon me, and He has anointed me. He has made me the Messiah, because Messiah, that's what it means, the anointed one. He's made me the one. This is the words, these are the words of the long-promised Messiah. The Spirit of God is upon me. He's anointed me to bring the salvation that His people did not have but desperately needed. This is one who'd be set apart by God to preach good news. To preach good news, that is literally to preach the gospel to the poor, to heal the brokenhearted, to, to heal broken hearts to proclaim liberty to the captives and recovery of sight to those who are so long in darkness they could not see anymore, to proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord. In Israel, every 50 years, there was a year of jubilee. Every 50 years was the day when, was the year when all debts would be forgiven, all slaves would be set free, when, when there would be freedom again, lands would be returned to their original families. It was a great year. It was a joyful year. But that was a, a picture of what Jesus Christ would do, the Messiah would do to set His people truly free, not just from a physical bondage, but from a spiritual bondage. And now that's the year that Christ has come to proclaim, to proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord, that at the right time, in God's time, this Redeemer, this Anointed One would come. This is the anticipation of Isaiah's prophecy. Jesus reads this about the one whom God would send, but then He declares the fulfillment in Himself. See, the Jews knew, the Jews knew that they needed this Messiah. The Jews longed for this Messiah. The Jews in Jesus' day were wanting the Messiah to come, but they missed the spiritual point of His redemption and salvation. They missed the point of what God was going to do amongst them. They were looking forward to the Messiah to rescue them from the physical bondage, to rescue them from under Roman rule and oppression. They were looking, and, and indeed, that was upon them because of their sin, but what they wanted was God to remove the judgment without actually addressing the sin. He, they wanted God to take away the consequences without fixing the problem that led to the consequences, without changing the heart. It's, it's like an unfaithful husband who showers his wife with gifts to try to make up for it, but never actually addresses his unfaithfulness and continues on and then wonders, why aren't things better? Why aren't things fixed? It's 
that how you and I repent sometimes, or, 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 or more than sometimes? We don't like the consequences, and we know we feel the, the hand of God's discipline on us, and we, we don't like it, so we pray for that to be removed without actually wanting to address the sin, or without making the sin the focus of our repentance, of our repentance. But Jesus was going to teach them a message and to show them and to, to, to declare to them this is, this is what they needed was something far more than just a physical fix. And there's really a, there's a drama. There's a drama in the text here. Jesus reads this, and then He rolls up the scroll. He gives it back to the attendant, and then, as was the custom, He sat down to preach. He stood to read, He sat, and He sit down to preach. And then you see the eyes of all who are in the synagogue were fixed on Him. They were all locked in on Jesus. Nobody wanted to miss a word of the message He was going to bring. What's He going to say? That's a, good, that's, a, that's a good focus for all of us to have as we hear the Word of God. I was going to bring this application to boys and girls. You need to focus on, on your minister who's bringing you Christ's Word from the pulpit. But then I realized it's not really just an application for boys and girls, is it? We all need to focus on what Jesus Christ says to us. And they were certainly fixed on Him. They were, they were looking. And then Jesus preaches a dramatic sermon. We're not sure if this is all He said or if this is just the main bullet, or if he wanted to say more but never got there because of their reaction. But he declares, today, this Scripture is fulfilled in your hearing. I'm not just talking about what, what Isaiah said a long time ago, and let's look at the history. I'm not talking about some unknown future time when there's going to be a deliverer from God. What I'm saying to you is, today, this Scripture is fulfilled. I am the one who is fulfilling this Scripture. Upon me, the Spirit of God has come, and He has anointed me to preach the gospel, as I'm doing in this very moment, to preach the gospel to the poor. This is what Jesus is saying to them, declaring to them healing and liberty and sight. But He's done, doing much more, because there's a line in what Jesus had read here in, in, in Luke 4 that I haven't addressed yet. It's the last line of verse 18, to set at liberty those who are oppressed. Now, that's actually not from Isaiah 61, it's from Isaiah 58. But why did Jesus bring this line into this reading that He was reading from Isaiah 61? Well, brothers and sisters, here's the wonderful good news. Jesus is not just coming to repeat what Isaiah said. He's coming to say, I'm going to proclaim the good news to you, but I'm going to do more. I am the one who will set you free. I'm not just saying, uh, talking about liberty, it's not just something I'm declaring to you, I'm actually making it happen, I'm making it true. I set you free. He, had a, he, he, he says to these people, he says to his, this captivated audience, he says, you are actually captives. You're captives to sin, you're captives to your own, your own uh, self-righteousness, you're captive to all, that, and you need to be set free if you don't have faith, you need to believe in me and to be set free. I will set you free. I am God's plan for your liberty, is what Jesus Christ is declaring. This is a great message, isn't it? It's a great message for us to consider. You know, I was thinking this week of, of redemption prison ministry and our prison pastors who go and and, and, and lead chapel services and, and minister one-on-one -on -one to uh, the men in, in, who are incarcerated or to those who are being reintegrated back into society. But think about this message. To, to be able to bring it to say, yeah, to, to be able to declare a liberty that is far deeper than simply a removing of the bars and an opening of the gates to let you out of a prison for a few more years in this life. But to say, even though you may still be behind bars and you may never see the light of day again, yet there is liberty in Jesus Christ. There is freedom from the worst captivity, that which grips your soul. It's a wonderful message to bring. It's the opportunity, you know, it's in the bulletin, the opportunity to volunteer, to even mark grade courses that come through from men and, and, or women in prison who, through Redemption Prison Ministries. So it's a way of even perhaps for you to think about and to have a way in behind bars to speak of the great good news and the freedom that is given in Jesus Christ. But this is not just a message that's good to preach behind uh, prison walls. It's a message that you and I need because this is the provision for all who are trusting in Jesus Christ. Liberty to live for Him. Sometimes the gospel can be an excuse, and perhaps it's been an excuse for you. 
No, I'm free in Jesus. That means I'm free. I can do what I want. I can go and indulge in this particular sin. I'm free. Now, you might not say it that bluntly, but as you're thinking through temptation and considering sin that you're being tempted with, you think, well, well he'll, he'll forgive me. Jesus is my Savior. He'll forgive me if I do this. It's just a little thing. It's but every time you make that choice, you're going back into the bondage. You want the bondage. You're saying, I'd rather be a slave to sin than to live freely for Christ. Because Jesus Christ sets you free not to do whatever you want, but He sets you free to give your life to Him, to live for God, the God who made you. My brothers and sisters in Christ, this is an amazing message to ponder when you struggle with sin, when the temptation, the battle of temptation comes, when you feel your own destitution, you wonder, what, what do I have? What, what, what am I? When, you, when your heart is broken and you're beaten up because of sin or, or other struggles and, 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 and when, you feel, when you feel that bondage, and I think that for, for us when we face temptation, when, when old sins come back to haunt us and we, we're thinking, am I ever going to be free of this? You can come back to the Lord Jesus. And you can take comfort in His promises and in His work. Not what my hands have done can save my guilty soul. Not what my toiling flesh has borne can make my spirit whole. Not what I feel or do can give me peace with God. Not all my prayers and sighs and tears can bear my awful load. Thy work alone, O Christ, can ease this weight of sin. Thy blood alone, O Lamb of God, can give me peace within. Thy love to me, O God, not mine, O Lord, to Thee, can rid me of this dark unrest and set my spirit free. That's what Jesus says. That's what He preaches and proclaims. He ushers in this grace and for you and I have tasted and seen that the Lord is good. This leads us to worship and praise Him, to say, thank you, Lord, and blessed be your name. And there we can say, indeed, glorify Jesus, not just as a good preacher, but as one who has made that difference in our lives. He is worthy of being glorified, for He is God who has freed us. And we can draw comfort. If you're not in Jesus Christ, this is the freedom you need. And may the Holy Spirit open your eyes, even if you sit there and say, what do I need to be free? As the Jews would say to Jesus in the Gospel of John, well, we, we've, never been, we've never been in bondage to anybody. What do we need to be free? When you say, I'm free and I don't need Jesus, you are in bondage. You're not free at all. Without Jesus, you are in bondage. And you need to respond to Jesus better than the people that you can read ahead or as we've read and see how the people responded. And they decided, I'd just rather just throw them off a cliff than to acknowledge my deep need for Jesus Christ. Don't respond that way. They, you know, they were curious. They even thought His words sounded pretty good, but there was no repentance. Don't respond like that today. Today, if you believe, you will be set free. That's the promise of the gospel that Jesus Christ proclaims and that Jesus Christ provides. Jesus powerfully preaches Himself as the one God promised would set captive sinners free. It's the message we've heard, prophecy made in Isaiah, prophecy fulfilled in Christ, and freedom granted by the Redeemer, the anointed one sent of God. And Jesus Christ cared enough, and He loved you to bring that message, and for you to sit here this morning and to hear that message. And shouldn't we care enough to also bring that message to others? This is a message for the world, this message of good news for the poor, healing for the brokenhearted, liberty for the captives, sight for the blind. It's not a message of the social gospel whereby we just focus on the body and we remove sin out of the equation and we try to make people feel a bit better about their lives and try to help them out. Yes, the gospel does care about people's physical lives, but it cares about the soul first of all. But this is, this is a real message of salvation. All around us, all around you, are people who are imprisoned. All around you, people are seeking and desperately searching for freedom. They want freedom from authority. They want freedom from responsibilities. They want freedom from the burdens of life. They want freedom of all kinds. Even death more and more becomes a preferred out to find, try to find some freedom from the struggles of life. But only Jesus Christ can make you free indeed.
Only Jesus Christ can make you free. When people take death as a way to freedom, it only secures their bondage forever. Only Jesus Christ can make you free indeed. He has made, if He has made you free this morning, then tell others. You can't make them. You can't, you can't rescue them. You can't free them. But you know very well that Jesus Christ can. Let's pray. Oh Lord our God, thank You for this message of freedom. Thank You for this great and glorious message of Jesus Christ, not just one who proclaimed about it, but who provides it. And thank You, Lord, we can hear that same message today, that Jesus Christ is the same one who provides. And as this Word has gone forth, Lord, the message is not to look to the man in the pulpit, but to the Savior who has come, who has gained this freedom and who provides it gloriously by His Spirit. Lord, give freedom to those who are living in bondage this morning. And to those, Lord, who are struggling with sin and who, who, who are showing a preference or struggling to, to, to live in that freedom and wanting to go back to that, that bondage, back to old sin, Lord, give them strength to overcome and may they live and walk in Your freedom to live for Your glory. And we do pray, Lord, that You would give us great comfort in these words and great thanksgiving for this Savior. And indeed, give us, uh, give us, Lord, to walk faithfully through this life until we reach that perfect freedom where sin will no longer tempt us nor hold us back in heaven. Lord, we thank You for this message. May we respond better than this audience, than, the, than this congregation did. May we as a church respond much better by Your grace. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Let's sing hymn 503 as we consider this message, Out of My Bondage, Sorrow, and Night. Hymn 503, and we will stand to sing.
after God dismisses us with His blessing, we'll sing our doxology, which is in your bulletin, hymn 11, verses 1 and 2. The Lord dismisses us with His blessing, so receive it in faith. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make His face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up the light of His countenance upon you and give you peace. And go in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen.